podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to episode 97 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And we're going to be talking about quite a big topic in this one. Um, It's reparenting. What is it? And how to use this process within the therapy room. What a marvellous topic. I think I said at the last podcast, well, I think I need several, several podcasts to discuss this one uh, because it's quite a meaty subject. But, you know, when you sort of, when we came on and introduced me and we get to say it's 97, I feel I'm on a countdown to 100. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) When it gets to 98 and... 99, which is the penultimate one, um, you know, uh, I'll be glad when we reach the 100th one. But let's get back to the subject. So it's a meaty subject. I mean, part of me thinks we should sort of start off with definitions of what reparenting is. That is the title of the podcast, is it? Reparenting. Yeah, reparenting. What is it? Yeah. So I'll hand that definition over to you. For me, <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Bob. It is quite a meaty subject. Yeah, for me, it, you know, the, the relationship between the client and the therapist, you, we've spoke about this a lot of times, is adult to adult, and I'm okay, you're okay. But I think there are certain times where we play a parenting role in that relationship, and we can model, you know, an appropriate relationship to the clients before we let them free into the world, if that makes sense. <laughs> so if they've got attachment problems, you know, if, if the parent wasn't there for them a lot of the time, we can model consistency and an appropriate relationship with them that kind of shows them that it's safe and it's okay to, to have that relationship again. Very, very well put. Oh, I, good. I um, and very true, by the way. I think I'd like to add a little bit, and that is that I know both and you were both you and I work this way, um, but we both work in a developmental way. Yes. Yeah. And so, def- by definition, what you've just talked about there will always happen. Now, we may have contracts about it because you started off with Eric Byrne talking about contracts, and I really agree with you. Um, uh, so there's a focus where, where we're going. We might want to call it spot reparenting, if you like, or sessional reparenting. Yeah. Uh, and there's an adult-to-adult contract about that process you just talked about. And, you know, that, that's important to bear in mind. Now, if you take the research, and I think it's something like 95, I think it's 95% is very mm-hmm. high, that most clients, when they come into the therapy room or when they decide to come to therapy, um, they want the therapist to fix it. Yeah. Them, or they want the therapist to solve it for them. So usually, by definition, they're handing over that, in inverted commas, parenting function. In the therapeutic process yeah now it doesn't necessarily mean the therapist will pick that up but that's i think usually the um unconscious desire um and often says stated by the way of the client when they first come through the door yeah so they yeah, put, i agree they put that mentor or that parent or that or that father Christmas who can fix everything onto the therapist from the moment they move through the door. Now they might fight against that. However, I believe that's the desire that's there. Yeah. And to a certain extent, I suppose the situation 
put them in that position anyway. You know, if you think about even just, you know, logically the situation, we're in a, a an environment that we're familiar with, that we feel comfortable in. The first time a client comes, they don't know who's going to open the door to them. They've probably never been there before. So they're not going to feel in an okay position on that first session when they walk in, really. They're going to feel vulnerable. They're, they're going to feel not 100% confident. Yeah, and as I said, I think in a couple of podcasts back in time, um, they usually um, come from their younger self. Yeah. And if you're thinking developmentally and you're thinking of the, that the past affects the present and you're thinking about what developmental needs or tasks weren't fulfilled at particular ages in the client's history, then the reparenting contract or mentoring makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think I first started reparenting when I was fostering. Yes. <laughs> Not really knowing at all any of the psychological, you know, impact of it because I you know I was fostering way before I started doing psychotherapy mm. but that's basically what I was doing with the the looked after kids that came through yeah absolutely, absolutely. you know practically not just emotionally you know a lot of the children would regress when they they came and want to be reparented that's why so I don't know the answer to this because I've never asked you before actually but on average, how long do foster, your foster kids stay with you? Um, well, at any time, you know, the, the longest was nine years and the shortest was respite for a weekend. So, it, you know, it That's was not an average. No, no, no. There wasn't for us because we, we were passed for long term and short term and respite. So it just you know, depended. You know, that I'm asking because. Usually when you contract with a person to do spot reparenting or do regressive psychotherapy where you might look at what tasks and de deficits weren't uh, met, it's termed long, you know, in inverted commas, long-term work. I can believe it, yeah. In other words, anywhere between sort of a year to five or six years. Yeah. And for the people who are counsellors and therapists listening to us, it would be where, with contracts, where the therapist would step into the transference and play that parenting role, a healthy parenting role, though. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can remember the first time I took it to supervision because I, I knew that we were falling into that relationship, that I, I was falling into that parenting role and I felt uncomfortable doing that it was in the early stages of you know my training and I felt a lot better when my supervisor said it's okay providing you know you know what you're doing and you come out the other side of it it's it's okay to get into that transference if there's a therapeutic reason for doing it <laughs> and it's and I believe it needs to be contracted for yeah, I think that was the thing. I don't think it was contracted. I think it just happened over the, the period well, of therapy that, yeah, that we yeah. were together. Well, that's yeah. very common, of course, what you've just said there, that in the transference, um, it's easy for the therapist to fall, in the, fall into the parental role, if you want yeah. to call it, mentoring role, and it's very, very easy for the client to give it to the therapist. Yeah. Now, that's why I think in the contracting right at the beginning, I think there needs to be an adult to adult contract where the two people specify, you know, what the outcome is. So there's an overall contract. I also think there may be sessional contracts, yeah, uh, which will also help in this process. And a lot of transfers, anyway, is going to be parent and child led if you're working in a developmental, aggressive way. Mm. That's why I say contracts are so important. Yeah. 
yeah do you think it's easier to to do this when you know you're of a certain age as a therapist I know psychologically we can go into the parent and the child even if the therapist is younger than the client yeah I I, I hesitate if you'd asked me this question some time ago I think I might have a discussion about the gravitas of L, you know you know physical elder people and psychological ages and I, I, I hesitated in my response back to you because my daughter who's 24 nearly and her husband who's I know 30 they've started up a, a youth I, th I think it's, I'll call it a youth club but I think they're going to say it's more like youth culture it's called revolutionary youth and, it, and um, it meets sort of I think Mondays and Wednesdays and it's led by the church, which is another subject I know we could talk about a bigger parent, but anyway. But there's no doubt, without my shadow of a doubt, that in the youth club, the the uh, quite disturbed, a lot of them are quite disturbed, um, for, for lots of various reasons, um, a lot of issues, they, that the, my daughter and husband play that mentoring yeah parental role and they're 24 my say my daughter's 24 yeah. so in the relationship between the youth anything from 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 but mostly i suppose average 13 14 15 16 um the my daughter and husband play that parenting role yeah definitely without a doubt whether you want to call that reparenting i'm not so sure but it actually happens yeah 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 so i think it doesn't it doesn't have to be somebody who's 40 50 60 70 it can happen a lot younger in that sort of process i've just talked about just you know sometimes my clients refer to me as the therapy mum yeah, see, there we are. The desire. You know, I mean, they actually say that out loud that I'm the therapy mom. <laughs> you see, you see, I think I think clients basically in the type of work we do, the long term developmental work, they come to therapy for two major reasons, I think. One is to understand themselves better. And secondly, a desire for a different outcome. Yeah. And in that process, we'll transfer that parental role onto you. Now, in the last podcast, I was talking about the duty of therapists to take on the beacon of hope. Yeah. While the client dealt with the dark side. And in this podcast, I think, and hopefully it's contractual, by the way, the therapist is taking on the beacon of the healthy parent. Yeah, and that's that's the key to it the healthy parent is that we're modeling what a healthy relationship is oh. and the ability to to work through issues or the relationship or upset or change or anything and be okay at the other end of it which often the client hasn't necessarily had that's right the different outcome yeah yeah oh. absolutely now it's a very, you know, important and interesting subject we're talking about. And certainly, you know, because it's quite controversial, because the other side of this is the misuse of this process. In other mm -hmm. words, that the therapist who may unconsciously, let's say hopefully it's unconsciously, um, might move into a place where they infantilize the client in other words they they don't allow the client to work through these developmental tasks we're talking about or these deficits and they don't allow the person to grow up if you like yeah yeah you've got, you've got this sort of parent child symbiosis going on far longer than it should yeah and on the extreme side of all this, if you want to talk about real critics of this type of work, they might want to call this brainwashing. Mm. This infantilized 
symbiosis the clients could be that's the extreme way of looking at this yeah and i think there's a dark side of ta that was guilty of this uh but i'm not talking about that that extreme side i'd like to go to the middle where um we do spot reparenting under contracts where we uh, may step into transference in terms of um the potential for a healthy parent and that we facilitate people to work through their developmental deficits their developmental tasks and get a different outcome yeah so how, how would you use this in the therapy room would would you use this in an educative way in the therapy room or just through modeling it oh well that's really it depends on the therapist but i mean certainly there's an educative part to this that's definite in terms of looking at the developmental deficits and the tasks that weren't met and maybe some of the toxicity but you may certainly might be some educative sessions that's true um it depends on the style of the therapist um on the other hand if a therapist comes in and talks about sexual abuse talks about physical abuse talks about toxicity of their own parents talks about trauma post-traumatic trauma flashbacks or goodness knows what then we know that the pair internalized parents they were in their head are pretty unhealthy mm. and we may step into the transference of using the word transference again and 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 play a much more healthy parent yeah. now usually hopefully this is done in contract at the beginning that's what i just said um and the client um like of course you're a therapy mum when you've just talked about that they understand that the process the process what i'm talking about is that you're going to be role modeling going to be through the techniques of progression providing a different opportunity and potential to have a different outcome yeah it didn't have all those years ago yeah and i think through, go through, on. Permi through permissions a lot of protection but lots of validation yeah the client can work through those relational needs that were perhaps so challenging all those years ago and have a different outcome today so that when they're in uh, relationships today uh, where they are needed to function in a healthy way at the workplace or whatever it is in life they have a different script in their head and yeah. are more likely to be able to do that yeah yeah because I, I think when, when you know the majority of time that i've you know use this in the therapy room as being around you know consistency and permission and validation and those sort of things like you were saying earlier on that you know that the client can get it wrong and it doesn't mean it's the end of the relationship you know working through a a healthy reconciliation somehow between the two of us because you know sometimes the client will attempt to push the therapist away by i don't know just just pushing the boundaries to see how how reliable they're going to be in the situation you know and maybe even if we say i don't know that you 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 need to attend the sessions on time and they push the boundaries and they they're constantly turning up late and then wanting to see us or things like that that we're quite consistent in what we're saying that's right and we must remember that the the end goal of this which is hopefully contracted for, is that the person is able to function in a healthy relationship or in life yeah. in a way that they, way that isn't so challenging to them. Yeah. And that's why this is happening. Yeah. And if we're going to work with the inner child and the younger self, almost by definition, they will transfer parent figure or a mentor onto you. and that's the relationship that is set up for all the things i talked about earlier in this podcast yeah 
yeah yeah absolutely which again you know for for in the early days of of being a therapist it's it can be quite daunting sometimes very very daunting and it's a million miles away from cbt yes yeah absolutely you see cbt is the favored therapy um of the nhs you usually have 12 or 16 sessions and that might be very useful for people in terms of changing their thought patterns being able to change their behaviors because their thought patterns have changed and it's not the type of therapy we're talking about here absolutely yeah now if you want to deal with your deep trauma your deal deep abuse the toxic you know deep issues coming from toxicity of parents or significant others um then i believe that we need to visit the past because the past affects the present and then of what then what happens we find out that the traumatized younger self or the abused younger self or the emotionally repressed younger self needs permissions needs validation from a i'll put it in inverted commas a healthy parent which perhaps they never had before yeah. so they can be different in life today yeah that's a completely different type of therapy and it usually takes what i call long-term therapy um, than what you would get on the nhs yeah absolutely Very much, it's much deeper it's yeah. dealing with trauma it's dealing with severe emotional neglect it's dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and it's all, all all works under the belief that the past affects the present so you have to visit the past and usually the dynamic that's set up is this you know younger self parent dynamic which we could call um the name of this podcast really a reparenting process yeah we're working towards a the establishment, establishment of a healthy parenting system so that they can be different today. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's like you say, I think you touched on it earlier on, it, it's a, there's a very delicate line to be drawn between, you know, modelling that healthy parenting relationship and then that, I don't want to say abusing the situation, but do you know what I mean? Playing the one up in the therapy room. Well, I think it is abusing. It is abusing the situation. If you're going to play a, you know, a, a sort of expert, a sort of person that is um, maybe going to take advantage of the situation, um, what, you know, at the worst, you'll just repeat history for the person. Mm, yeah. So it's something to really, really look out for. Yeah. It's something to be trained in. Um, I, I did many, many years of training to enable me to work at these sorts of levels. And I my whole therapy way of thinking for this type of long time work is that the past affects the present. Yeah. The trauma's in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have to go back there to help them explore that, hopefully take on a more healthy parenting, if you want to call it that way, so that they can be, so they can leave therapy in a, with a more healthy way of functioning and dealing with relationships. Yeah. Often one of the questions I ask clients, you know, at some point, and I'm not sure at what point it comes up was you know how how would you know that you'd done a good job you know what would your parents do that you knew you'd done a good job or that you got something right and the same for the opposite you know how would you know that you got something wrong what what would your parents you know behave towards you and that's quite insightful and often it can be mirrored in the therapy room yeah, they're good questions to ask. You know, you know, what did you get from the significant death or didn't get? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, they're good questions. Yeah, because it gives me an insight because often you, uh, you, you get a sense that the client's looking for recognition or validation or, you know, when you're talking, it's like they don't want to give you the wrong answer, even though there is no right or wrong answer in the therapy room. But it, it's, yeah, it it's interesting. I, I love the work that we do and there is a certain amount of reparenting that takes place in there. There has to be. You see, this is a long-term developmental work. Yeah. Now, for both of us who think this way, that the past affects the present. You know, when we're working this type of client, they've usually been highly traumatised. They have a toxicity in the relationship with their significant others in their past. They may suffer from cumulative neglect. Yeah. They may have shame-based histories. So we have to go and explore the past and look at what needs healing mm. and hold out the potential of a more healthy way of being. And you want to call that reparenting, be so. But the reason is, is that they can be different and have a more healthy relationship today. Yeah. Can that be misused by therapy? Certainly. Um, can people, can therapists make dreadful errors in this type of therapy? Yes, but if the therapist comes from an I'm okay, you're okay position, has had the training to be able to work in this regressive developmental way, um, hopefully the, the things that we're talking about here can be minimised. Mm. And the potential for effective therapy with people who have been so hurt and traumatised is great. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, 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 let's sit on another point before we end this podcast. For the therapists that enter in this type of work, that have been trained in this type of work, you know, it, it's not for the faint-hearted. In other words, people who work with these types of clients who've had such difficult histories and who project onto you the hope of a different type of uh, process than what they had all those years ago um, can be very draining for a therapist. Yeah. And exhausting, mm. by the way. So it's not for the faint-hearted. Because you're going to lift, you're going to hear a lot of traumatic processes. You're going to be, hear a lot of uh, perhaps traumas and neglect or developmental deficits or whatever we want to to call this. And um, I think therapists need to have a passion for doing this type of work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It it's a, a heavy a heavy burden to carry at certain times maybe <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility yeah i'm yeah. afraid don't do it if you're not prepared to hold that responsibility if you're not prepared to get yourself well trained if you're not prepared to have a good supervisor don't do don't work in this way yeah and again you know safeguarding ourselves one of the things that we were taught quite early on was you know the the ratio of these sort of clients you know like the 80 20 rule that you you can't have those sort of clients all the time no you, not, you, not the way i've just been explaining it yeah you're absolutely right and on another level it's a completely another level you may do some mentoring and role playing uh quite a lot with many clients yeah yeah might not go to those levels Deeper levels yeah there. they can be they can be dealt with in a you know in a different way yes yeah may do lots of um uh, therapy work which includes us playing out the projection of a mentor or, or a healthy significant other yeah and lots of inner parent 
in a child walk, which doesn't mean we have to go to these great depths. I'm not saying with all clients we do that, but we may do what you want to call reparenting work in a different level, almost like osmosis or role-playing or mentoring uh, to many of our clients. Yeah. Which I, th I think, you like, I completely agree. And I think we do that a lot more regular with clients, the, the higher level work rather than the, the deeper work, let's say. It's like yeah. a continuum. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of describing it. Yeah. 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 However, you and I, I know on the same page here, and many of my colleagues at the Institute and many of my colleagues who work with relationally all come from the process that the past affects the present. Yeah. We would be visiting the past, whether it's at a lighter place on the continuum or, or the heavier place. But the the process is the past past affects the present. And we often need to go into our more darker places to get to the lighter places. And I know there's a continuum in this as well. Yeah. But it's not like solution focused therapy. It's not like CBT. It's not like, you know, that type of therapy, which is at a different level. Even though I believe, this is their story altogether, I believe that clients still project, you know, a, a parent on these, on these people, whether they're doing CBT, solution-focused therapists, but the therapists themselves, because they're not trained in, in the ways we're talking about, um gear the therapy to a different place yeah i've not, i've never i've never witnessed cbt so i don't actually know what it would be like in the therapy room with somebody i i know a bit about it but not not that much yeah well you know there's a place and time for yeah absolutely therapy and but if you are the type of therapy we're talking about and podcast is really about reparenting, then it's much more developmental, regressive work. And the thesis is the past affects the present. And you work in a long, much more long term developmental way. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like working developmentally. It fits well with, with me. It makes sense. And you know me, I like things to make sense, Bob. Don't we all? Yes. So oh, what we're going to be talking about next time. Oh, next time. Number 98, I think. Number 98, cultivating resilience in the therapy process. Oh. I like a bit of resilience. I think we could all do with some of that. I'm going to get some champagne in and uh, put it in the fridge. Oh, get put it, it in the fridge for a couple of weeks. For the next two or three weeks, because we're heading towards number 100. We are. We need to come up with a wonderful topic for a hundred, Bob. We've not got one for a hundred yet. Well, it could be could about it could be about the therapeutic uh, process around aging. Oh, that'd be a good one. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, it will be wonderful. We we need to work on a really good title over the next couple of weeks for that one. But until next time, Bob. Until episode it ninety eight, could be, it could be something like. Uh, the pitfalls and celebrations of you know of our therapeutic careers or something but anyway whatever it is we will find a uh juicy one i'm sure we'll work <laughs> on it for the next two weeks Bob. yeah until next time have a good week yeah and you Speak bye -bye. To you bye bye you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.